Well, today we're kicking off a new series. If you're part of our Facebook page, you will have seen this. If you're not, you should follow us. And it's called Old School. And it's not about the theological significance of cassette tapes or black and white TV. It is instead about the Old Testament. Over the next five or six weeks, we're going to school, as it were, to learn about the Old Testament. See what I did there? Old school. Thank you. I was pretty happy with that. You see, many Christians literally have no idea about the Old Testament. The importance or the plot line of it in the bigger narrative of the Bible. They either think it's a bit weird and a bit boring and therefore they don't bother studying it. Or they think it has limited application. That it's been superseded because of what Jesus did on the cross. So why worry about the Old Testament and weird purification laws and things like that when you can just worry about Jesus' ministry and his teaching, right? Well, my answer to that line of thinking is how can you have any real idea about the significance of Jesus and the significance of the role that he plays in the narrative of the Bible if you don't actually appreciate the story that he fits into, right? How can you understand what Jesus is saying or preaching in his ministry if you don't realize what he's responding to, yeah? The story and the drama thus far. Now, I know you've got masks on, but you really got to, you know, you got to try and project through that mask, yeah? I've got to hear you or I'm going to talk for three hours. No, I'm not. But I've got to hear you. And so while there are some weird parts and boring parts to the Old Testament, we'll do our best to skip these. And while there are certain things that the, uh, Jesus has superseded in the Old Testament or that are confusing, I want to unpack over the next few weeks some of the major themes and some of the crucial moments in the Bible, in the plot of the Bible that take place in the Old Testament that I think is super crucial for our understanding of the story of Jesus and how we interpret him. So that when we come to unpack his teaching, when we come to unpack who he was and what he did and what it means to be disciples of him, we're not like people trying to understand the Star Wars films, you know what the Star Wars films are, without the knowledge that Darth Vader is actually Luke Skywalker's dad. Like, that's a pretty important part to the story plot, right? I mean, could you imagine, pick any series, it doesn't matter whether it's The Matrix, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. Could you imagine how confusing it would be and how limited your sense and understanding of the story at large would be if you started with film two or three in either of those stories? And yet, that's what we often do in our Christian discipleship, isn't it? We skip to the Jesus part, the part that's not confusing, that's not boring. And in doing so, we often miss the entirety and the significance of what Jesus does and says in light of the whole story. And so I want to go back to the very start of the story this morning, to Genesis 1.1 and the creation narrative, and follow the overarching plot until we meet the character of Jesus. Does that sound all right? Yeah? Oh, I heard you. Let's do this. How are you doing online? You want to type in the box and say amen? Go for it. I'll see it in half an hour. And while we're going to look at some things and some events like creation and covenant and law and things like that, My focus in this series isn't so much to teach a particular topic or to teach you about a particular phenomena, but for you to catch the pulse or the heartbeat of what these things mean in the overarching plot of the Bible. The role that they play in developing the story that Jesus enters in the first gospel of Matthew. And if there was ever a topic that Christians tend to miss the plot, miss the story that's going on, because they're trying too hard to extrapolate information, it's got to be the topic of creation. The story of creation, as told in Genesis, would have to be, would it not, one of the most hotly debated parts of the entire Bible. 
I mean, did God really create the world in seven days? Like, was it seven literal days or seven figurative days? Did he create the universe as is and therefore it's pretty young? Or did he create it with like the inbuilt mechanism of evolution and therefore it's pretty old? I mean, can you believe in science and creation at the same time? We bring so many questions that we want the text to answer and yet most of these questions have little to no significance about the story the Bible is trying to tell us. And this is one of the primary ingredients we need to understand when we read the Bible, that it's a story. Say with me, one, two, three, it's a story. You two online, one, two, three, it's a Thank you. If you take nothing else from today, although I really hope you do because I've worked hard, <laughs> take this, that reading the Bible, it's a story. It's not a history book. It's not a Wikipedia page. It's not a scientific journal or an academic article. It's a story. And yes, as people of faith, we believe it's a true story, but it's a story nonetheless. And you've got to ask yourself, well, what's the purpose of a story? What's the heart of a story? Is the primary job of a story to report all of the details conclusively and precisely to the hearer? Is the heart of a story to provide information or data? No. What's the purpose of a story? It's to convey the nature or the journey of an event, place, or person. You know that famous saying, I use this all the time, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. You know, aside from the humor, there's actually some inherent wisdom in that comment. Because the precise nature of details and facts aren't at the heart of a narrative. That's not what a story is concerned with. It's concerned with the journey and the nature of an event or person. That's most important. And I want you to keep that in the back of your head as we walk through. You know, during my first interview for this position as pastor here at Bright, Adam asked me, to share with the interview panel a bit about myself so they could get to know me, so they could understand who I was, my nature. Could you imagine if I started, if I responded with this explanation? Well, my name is Matthew Thomas Hornby. I was born on the 5th of May, 1986 at 9.58pm, weighing 8.6 pounds, I currently stand 182 centimeters and I weigh just under 85 kilograms, depending if I've been to the bakery or not that day. I have blue eyes, both of which don't work very well. And I tend to very much gravitate to the right hemisphere of my brain. I have high levels of testosterone and most confusingly, I also have high levels of estrogen. Could you imagine if I gave that explanation? No, I began to tell stories. I began to say things about my passion, whether it be for my family or whether it be for my faith. I began to tell stories about how I engage in life with my whole heart, how I don't do anything in halves, how I love challenges because of the creativity and the problem-solving opportunity that challenges bring. I began to tell stories about my dislike for politics, how I hate red tape and bureaucracy and pretty much anything that resembles administration, how I love to be in relationship with people, especially in a capacity where I get to encourage or inspire them, stories about how I invested in Bitcoin and I'm a risk taker by nature. And which explanation do you think captures more of who I really am? The information and the facts or the story? And this is the reality of the Bible. It's a story. 
It's fundamentally concerned about conveying the nature of God and his love affair with humanity. And I say all of that to say that when we read the first chapter of Genesis, you have to remember that the author's not trying to disprove Darwinism. He's not trying to create a scientific edifice that defends Christianity. No, it's a story. And he's trying to convey the nature of who God is, and that he loves us. So, let's begin the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, we're going to stop here for a bit because there's a lot going on in these 10 words that you probably haven't come across before. Firstly, the word for in the beginning in the Hebrew language is the word bereshit, which means it doesn't mean at the very start or the very first chronological moment in time. It actually means way back when. You see, the author, Tim Mackey, a scholar in ancient Hebrew, says if he was interested in trying to convey a specific moment in time to tether when creation happened, there were plenty of words he could have used. But instead, he picks this word, which is translated to uh, way back when. Way back when God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the author isn't trying to lay out a specific fact sheet of exactly when creation happened. He's trying to say, well, a long time ago, it doesn't really matter when, God created. What's important is the nature of a creating God, not when he did it. And what did he create? The heavens and the earth. Now, I want you to do a little exercise with me. Trust me. Close your eyes. You two online, close your eyes. And I'm going to read the first line of the Bible, and I want you to paint a picture in your head of what you hear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you can open your eyes and you're going to have to project your voice. What did you see in your mind's eye? Shout it out to me. What could you see? The universe. What else did you see? Okay, what else did you see? Splitting. Oh, dear Lord. What else did you see? Yep, what else? Shout it out. Okay, great. What else? Got active. Did anyone see the planet Earth? Did anyone see a spherical globe and the universe? Yeah, and stars and space and all of that stuff. You know, this is the second imperative when we come to read the Bible. That not only do we have to remember that we're reading a story that's concerned about the nature of things and not facts about things, we also have to remember that we're reading the Bible, that when reading the Bible, excuse me, it's a cross-cultural experience. Let me explain what I mean by that. Do you think when the author wrote this verse 3,000 years ago, that he was picturing in his mind the cosmos, or a round planet, or the world as we know it? No. Why? Why? Because it was only in the 1960s that the very first image of our planet came into existence. The round planet, the universe, the space, the cosmos that you and I picture when we hear these words. You see, the problem is that when we see the Hebrew word earth, we think, well, that's simple. We, we've got an English word for that. We'll translate it to earth. However, what we mean by the word earth is very different to what the author meant by the word earth. The Hebrew word used for earth is the word shamayim, which means earth, lowercase e, or land. What the author is intending by the word earth is soil or ground, not a round spherical globe. The true is same with the word heavens. 
in our post 20th century modern worldview, we assume that the author means the universe or the cosmos, or space. And yet again, the word, while translated to heavens, actually is more closely translated to the word sky. You've got to think about this. 3,000 years ago, this dude sitting on a, I don't know, bit of nature, and he's like, in the beginning, God created what's up there and what's down here. Not God created the cosmos and a round, rotating, spherical ball we call Earth. And so that's the most simple literary sense of this text. And not only is this explanation reinforced by the word used for created in Hebrew, but we begin to get a clue, pay attention here, what the author is wanting us to understand about the nature of God and his creation. The word for created is the word bara. Try and say that with me, bara. Kind of almost got to clear your throat to say that. And rather than meaning bringing something into existence out of nothing, what the word means is to shape or to bring about. It's kind of like a potter with their clay. When we say that they created a vase, We don't mean that they invented, that they brought out of nothing the clay itself. What we mean is that they used the clay and they shaped it in a way. They created something. It's like if Zach, my son, was to come into the kitchen and say, Hey, Dad, come and see what I made. Come and see what I created. Who knows that when I get into his bedroom and I see this tower of wooden blocks that I don't go, shut the front door. You what? You brought these wooden blocks into existence? (gasps) How did you do that, mate? No, I understand that his creating is about bringing order to what was just a mess of blocks on the ground, right? I understand that his creation is about what he has shaped from a chaos into a structure that now has order. Not that he brought something into existence from nothing. And this is what the author is wanting us to catch. That way back when, God shaped out of the chaos everything that's above and everything that's below, that he brought order. Now, obviously at some point, As people of faith, we believe that God did bring into existence out of nothing the universe and planet Earth. But that's not what Genesis 1 is trying to describe to us. Again, we see the author reinforce this in verse 2. He says, Now the earth, lower E, was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The earth or the ground was formless and empty. The Hebrew words for formless and empty are the words tohu vavohu. You want to say that? It's fun. Tohu vavohu. And it means uninhabitable and unordered. It's not that there was no earth. It's that it was uninhabitable and unordered. It was wild and dangerous. It wasn't a place habitable for humans, right? And, when the plot, and what the plot is working towards is that because God wants to share relationship with His chief creative work, humanity, He has to carve out of the chaos a beautiful and habitable place for us to dwell, right? Now, the next 20-odd verses... The author then depicts the order that God brings to that uninhabitable heavens and earth. And I don't have time to unpack it all, although there's lots of good stuff in here. So here's the quick synopsis. And I apologize for people at home. You're probably never going to be able to read that. Day one through three, God creates three domains or three realms. And then days four to six, he creates inhabitants that inhabit or govern those corresponding realms. 
So in day one, he creates the realm or the domain of time. Day four, he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, which govern, which inhabit that realm. You're following? Day two, he creates the realm or the domain of the sky and sea. Day five, its corresponding day, he creates all of the birds and all the sea life that then inhabit that domain. Same with day three. He creates the domain of land or the realm of land. And then day six, he creates all of the animals that inhabit that domain, including us, humanity. Now, one thing that I do want to mention that highlights the plot the author is beginning to weave throughout the story is in verse 11, when God creates the domain of land. Verse 11 says this, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees, on the land that bear fruit with seed in it. Now, follow this. If you weren't convinced up until now that the Bible is a story with a specific plot that God through the author is wanting us to catch, look at this. When God creates the domain of land, right, which includes things like rocks and hills and mountains and gorges and gullies and ferns and flowers and pine trees and cacti and all sorts of things, why is it that the only vegetation that the author writes to give example of the land is seed-bearing plants and fruit trees? Think about all the sorts of vegetation that's encompassed by the land and yet the author focuses on fruit trees. Why do you think he may have done that? Does a fruit tree rate a mention in the plot to come? Of course. He's setting us up. It becomes a central object around which the plot deepens and twists when Adam and Eve eat the fruit, the forbidden fruit from that tree. I mean, this is a carefully crafted story. Are you picking this up? Well, the last thing I want to touch on before we summarize the beginning of the Bible story, the plot that's going on in Genesis 1, is verse 26. Verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So this is the climax of creation, right? God is creating his image bearers. This is the high point of the story. And in terms of the plot, we're about to find out, we're about to understand why God wanted to shape or bring about order out of the chaos, for humanity to inhabit his creation. Yes, because he loved us and he wanted to share relationship with us, but it's more than that. Verse 26 says, So they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. You see, what God is wanting to do is share his reign and his rule with his image bearers. That's the plot of the entire biblical story in Genesis. That God in his love creates humanity in his own likeness, in his image, to share his reign and his rule with them. And the rest of the biblical story will be about what does humanity do with that reign and rule? Will they choose to rule in relationship with God according to His design and wisdom? Or will they try and reign and rule on their own accord apart from God? Now, obviously, we know how the next part of the story plays out. 
God in authenticating his love and desire to share his reign and rule with Adam and Eve has to make it an act of free will. So he gives Adam and Eve the choice to reign and rule in relationship with him or to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, Adam and Eve obviously choose autonomy. They choose to reign and rule by their own wisdom and in separation to God. And the bulk of the remaining Old Testament story, the bulk of the remaining Old Testament plot unpacks the devastating consequences of what happens when humanity tries to reign on their own apart from God. Amen? It leads to death and devastation. And without spoiling too much of the remaining plot, we get to the end of the Old Testament and the overwhelming impression left in the reader's mind, having tracked all the way through its narrative, is that God's reign and rule led to flourishing, led to paradise, led to freedom and prosperity, whereas humanity's reign leads to death and devastation. And the author elicits in the heart of its readers, as onlookers to how the plot outworks itself, the words of a Coldplay song. Oh, take me back to the start. Take us back to the start. We can't do it on our own, God. We realize that now. We can't reign and rule outside of relationship with you, God. Outside of your design and wisdom and power. Take us back to the start. Take us back to when we were reigning and ruling with you. And I wonder this morning if this has been your realization too. Oh God, take me back to the start. Take me back to that place where you reign and rule with me in my marriage, in my workplace, as a parent, in my friendships, in the way I deal and treat with money and resource and time. I can't do it on my own. And I know all too well that when I try, I'm no better than Adam and Eve. That I can't do it any better than the nation of Israel. That it always, always leads to brokenness, fear, chaos, and death. And this is why when Jesus comes in on the scene, that what he says is so profound. One of the very first things that Jesus declares in his ministry is found in Mark 1.15. Remember what he says? The kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is here. What's the kingdom of God? The word in the Greek for kingdom is the word basileo, which means the rule or the reign of God. God's reign and rule is back, y'all. You can go back to the start. You can choose to reign and rule with the creator of the universe once again. You can choose flourishing. You can choose paradise. You can choose the freedom and the salvation that comes with choosing to rule and reign with the Creator. This is now once again an option. And this is why the gospel is good news, right? Because it announces that humanity can once again be reunited can once again reign and rule with the creator of the universe. My clicker is not working. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, just going to have to do it without the really soothing music underneath. Do you want to just jump up, Adam, as I finish? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and your marriage isn't in a great place. Maybe you're constantly feeling lonely Gee, lockdown hasn't helped that. Maybe you're constantly feeling anxious or inadequate. Maybe your life hasn't panned out exactly how you were hoping thus far. Maybe you're not even sure about your own worth or value as a person. 
Or maybe you're so caught up in the busyness of life that like the Apostle Paul, you find yourself saying, the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things I don't want to do, they seem to be the things I do. You know, the good news this morning is that Jesus declares, help is here. The kingdom of God is here. You don't have to reign and rule in your own strength out of your own power and resource. God's reign and rule is back, amen? And just like the story of creation, His inherent promise is that His reign and rule leads to life. That it leads to flourishing. It leads to beauty in your marriage. It leads to prosperity in your finances. It leads to joy and forgiveness and all of the salvation gifts. So the question I want to leave you with this morning is the question that the author of Genesis leaves with his readers about Adam and Eve. Will you reign and rule with God in relationship with Him through His power according to His design and agenda and enjoy the beauty and the order and the flourishing and the life that comes with that rule and reign? Or will you try and reign and rule on your own? Let's pray. Father God, just so grateful that when you came back on the scene and declared your reign and rule is back that that was a life changing gift for us that Father that meant no longer did we have to struggle helplessly on our own even though our ancestors blew it in the Garden of Eden but finally the Messiah was back that the reign and the rule of the creator of the universe was back and back on offer to us. And so God, my prayer this morning for us as a church is would you help us see the collective wisdom of all of the people and the narrative of Scripture that's gone before us that depicts what happens when we try and take our own reign and rule in our own wisdom with our own agenda and our own resource. That God, would we learn from them and would we accept that beautiful gift which is to partner with You, to reign and rule with You, the Creator of the universe, so that all flourishing, all life, all joy and abundance and salvation can be ours only in reigning and ruling with you we give you praise amen